Time for our midday clinic, Friday midday clinic. Um, And to end the week this week, we're talking addiction and... Well, really anything that goes along with that of having maybe somebody in the family who you believe is addicted to something or being a family member trying to look after them or maybe it is yourself and you are sort of beginning to think, I don't know whether I need to get help for this or maybe this is an ongoing thing that's been going on for quite a few years. Uh, And the, the types of thing if I can put it that way, that people become addicted to, obviously changing over the years as well. Paul Spanjar is with me in the studio. Paul runs the Providence Project. Good to have you here. Um, first of all, tell me a little bit about you, first of all. How did how did you get into this? It's a very long story, uh, probably longer than the length of the show, but just to say that really addiction has um, uh, impacted on me both personally and professionally um, through close friends, family members. And I, I started working in the field of addiction treatment over 15 years ago now. And uh, just always been fascinated by the psychology, um, by the individual stories, really. You know, the, the most fabulous thing uh, about addiction treatment is no two stories are the same, no two people are the same. And, uh, you know, the, the, the joy we get from helping people change their lives. Um, and so, in, in a way, the work is quite addictive itself. It's so, it's so fascinating and so fulfilling. Um, that it's just, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of studied more and more and, and worked m- in, in various uh, kind of aspects of addiction. And, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's over 15 years now. What people may not realise is the Providence Project, sort of tucked away in Bournemouth, but sort of world-class centre that deals with people from, well, right, right across the world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we get inquiries from all over the world. We treat people from all over the world. The majority of our clients do come from the UK, mm. um, although from all parts, um, and it's mainly based on reputation. You know, most of the uh, clients that come to the project now come as a result of a friend of a friend, somebody they knew, um, an employer, and uh, you know, I think when you're looking for that sort of help something which is very sensitive and very personal, it's really important that it comes from some sort of recommendation. It's something that people are very nervous about, sort of just going onto the internet and randomly finding a centre. Mm. Um, and, and, and and so we've grown organically in that way, and uh, you know, we celebrate our 20th birthday next month. Um, so it's been great. We've just launched a new website uh, yesterday, um, which also offers people the facility for online chat, um, which is available from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m., round the clock inquiry lines, advice lines. So we're trying to, as well as the main services we provide, we're looking to provide other community based advice as well. People are always understandably interested about what actually goes on in these treatment centres. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you walk in through the door and what happens? Is it all, because I mean, there's been many movies based on yeah. this, there's a lot of literature, and is it talking therapy? What do you do? Are there people screaming all the time or literally climbing the walls desperate for a next fix or are they strapped to the bed? You're laughing at me because I bet you've heard all this before. Yeah, that's, I was thinking that's just the staff. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's I, actually I went to see a production in London a couple of months ago called People, Places and Things. It was absolutely fabulous and a really great um, way of demonstrating rehab. It was obviously written by someone in the know. Um, everybody is terrified at the thought of coming to rehab. There's this kind of uh, belief that something very mysterious and weird happens, and and it's all a little bit spiritual, and and it's not the case. Um, it's actually just a very uh, safe, caring, loving environment where people through both talking therapy and art and music and activities and assignments and lectures a whole and alternative therapies such as acupuncture or yoga through a whole variety of therapies first of all get off of whatever it is they're addicted to but then address the underlying issues and develop the skills and the tools to go back into the real world without having the need to, to go back to their, their fix. Mm. Um, so that might be some, some elements of stress management, anger management, family therapy, 
And everybody's treatment or care plan is individualised because everybody's different. So how do, how do you start it? Do you have them in for an interview and you have to work out almost quite quickly as to what would be the best plan for someone? Yeah, I mean, there are two main routes in. One is, is, is simply that somebody phones up, says, I've got a problem. We assess them. We can do that on the phone or face to face and we can arrange admissions very quickly. It might be that rehab is not suitable for them. For, for one reason or another, or it doesn't work for them around their lifestyle, in which case we can offer a variety of outpatient options as well. Or we're also seeing more and more people now in interventions where we're getting family members call us who are terribly worried about someone in their family who is denying the extent of their problem. And, and, and as many pe- anyone who's been affected by someone in their family having a problem will know that the sort of the dishonesty, the lies and the denial are, are often the most difficult elements to deal with when faced with an addiction. When you talk about interventions, immediately my mind goes to uh, what they do in the States, and I think they made a programme about it where uh, it's all very dramatic and it's almost like having almost like a a secret police swoop Mm -hmm. type thing on someone. Do we do that over here? We sometimes do, yes. Um, There are different models of, of intervention. There are three or four different ways of carrying out an intervention really the time we would recommend that type of intervention is if we're talking serious crisis. You know, in, in some families, it gets to a place, we, we, we intervened on, on a chap who's doing very well at the moment six or seven weeks ago, and it gets to a place where people are, they're dying. You know, he, he, alcohol dependent, um, liver rapidly deteriorating, malnourished, um, dehydrated, in and out of A&E, in and out of hospital. And so sometimes those interventions may seem quite um, dramatic or harsh, but actually sometimes we're talking about individuals that might only be weeks or months from, from, from not being alive anymore. So if it's, if it's that critical, then something has to be done quickly. Mm. Um, I mean, I, obviously, patient confidentiality is, is paramount. Absolutely. So I'm not even going to push you on any aspects like that. But I just wonder whether you could, um, you know, sort of like a case study scenario of what happens. Is it a phone call? What is it a phone call from a mum or, or a wife? Uh, and then you, you literally arrive. What? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, if, 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 so if a family were, were listening now, it would be a case of, you know, often the, the wife, husband, mother, father would give us a call, tell us about their concerns and the situation. We would then gather as much information from them about the individual and explain to them how intervention works. For intervention to work, we would then need to speak with other family members. Really, ideally, you want three, four, five people involved in the process. But just to check that it's not just one person who's got things a bit out of proportion? or Partly that, to get a true um, account of what's happening. But more importantly, moving forward, for an intervention to be successful, the more family members that are in it together, the more chance there is of success. And on the day of intervention, we like there to be four or five people there if possible. So we, we gather the information and then we help people. As part of intervention, we get people to write letters and we provide them with a template, we talk them through it, we meet up and we often do a, a dummy run through. Mm-hmm. I'm actually because family. So without the person yes. there, so before they arrive they home or whatever is it is, maybe they're at work for the day or yep. whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And as you can imagine, families are often terribly anxious because their experience of challenging the person that's got the problem has normally got not gone down too well in the past. Well, they get angry, they walk out, they deny it, they blame me, and so they're very nervous. And and so we're just trying to encourage them to show them how it works. And how to set boundaries, because any family that's got addiction or alcoholism in it, the boundaries have normally been trashed over the years. And we're trying to show families how they can reset those boundaries to mean that certain behaviour is no longer going to be accepted. So what happens? This, let's, let's just say it's a chap that's been mm. at work for the day and the family is concerned and you've decided that the best thing to do is this intervention. Mm-hmm. They arrive home from work. Mm-hmm. Key in the front door. Yep. Seriously, literally turn the key, open the front door, and you're all there. Yes. Well, it's like some sort of Hollywood movie yeah, type it's, thing. It's um, and it brings but with up a, you know such a serious side to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it, it is, and it provokes a lot of anxiety. However, some of the families that call, I think we need to understand the desperation that faces lots of these families, and you know they're prepared to do whatever as soon as possible because of the, the situation they're living in. Um, 
and you know, very often, obviously, there's, a, there's an element of shock. The individual walks in and, and will often say, "What's going on?" And the interventionist will normally ask them just to sit down, explain that they are they are an alcohol interventionist. Uh, the family's contacted them; they're really worried. Could they just sit down? There's some things they'd like to to say. Would they be prepared to listen for 15, 20 minutes of what how it's been impacting on the family? There are times when they just run out of the house, um, but the, the the process isn't about. Uh, being aggressive, it's about doing it with love. You know, when we, when we prepare the letters and when we, we deal with the individual, we explain really clearly, the families are here because they love you, because they care and because they don't want you to die. Not because you're bad, not because you've done horrible things, although you may have done. We're here because we don't want to watch you die, we don't want to watch your children grow up without a dad, we don't want to watch you lose 20 years off your life, mm. we don't want to watch you lose another job. Whatever it might be, the consequences that they're having, um, so we come at it from a, from a position of love and care, not from a position of attack and you must do this and you must do that. And then they can either choose that they go along with it or not. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that next. We've also got questions for you as well, Paul. If you want to ask Paul anything... Um, Maybe you're, you're a family and you need needs a bit of help with a family member or you yourself have got a question for Paul. 0345 30 30 961 or text us 81333. Start your text with the word Solent. And, of course, if you wish to change your name or you don't want me to use your name, of course, that's absolutely fine. 0345 30 30 961. Paul Spanjara is in the studio from the Providence Project in Bournemouth. We're talking about addiction. And actually, we were talking about interventions just a moment ago, Paul. And um, you were just telling me you actually... You did one yesterday, um, which we we'll are very careful about details of this one because it actually is, forms part of a television yeah. program, which uh, which hasn't sort of uh, been broadcast yet. But uh, yeah, you're you're very much in call. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know, over the years, it's become apparent to me that the problem is certainly not getting any better, and the sort of people it affects are. That there is no norm, you know. In, in the past three months, we've we've carried out interventions from from highly, highly successful and still successful, you know, businessmen to to people that are completely destitute. Um, so, so it, it can affect anybody, and I guess that's one of the things that a that makes the work so fascinating, um, but b hopefully gives people some insight into that 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 addiction or an alcohol problem or a drug problem or a gambling problem can affect anybody. And I suppose what one of the reasons I come uh, on media is to, is to try and break down any stigma because, uh, you know, that stigma, that shame stops people from seeking help. It stops families from asking for help. They try and keep it hidden, protect it from the neighbours or the other members of the family or friends when actually one simple call or some help could, could just transform people's lives and, and, and that's that's the bit that doesn't need to happen. You know, nobody mm. needs to be ashamed because I think we can all honestly say if we look at our own lives, we all have somebody either in our family or in our friendship network who we can probably say may be bordering having a problem. What do you what do you class as having a problem? Do you have a benchmark for what a problem is? Um we have two main sort of simple benchmarks it's a bit more complex than this but generally speaking number one is does it the question is does it cost you more than money that's always the simplest question if if all your your substance or your alcohol costs you is the money that you spend on it and you can afford it no problem once it starts to impact on relationships on jobs on your health on your mental health on your well-being on your hobbies at that point, we would then consider that you ask yourself a serious question. If this is impacting on other areas of my life, then it may well be a problem. Um, but but also, sometimes we have to ask that question to the family because very often the individual, again, unfortunately part of the problem is denial. Denial is the biggest symptom of, of addiction. And the individual will often say, no, it's not. No, it's not. But yet we've got their wife on the phone saying, it's a nightmare. He, he comes in from work, he doesn't want to talk, all he wants to do is have open a bottle of wine, he's got no time for the children. But very often the person with the problem can't see that mm. because that's what addiction does, it blinkers your vision of, of what's happening around you. Or on things like, I mean, the example you've just given at opening the bottle of wine, um, 
drinking habits have changed very much in the last few years mm-hmm. in that it is, it, it's considered almost normal to get home from work and open a bottle of wine. I mean, we, we hear about all the figures in the news and on the media all the time about, you know, uh, that so-called middle-class drinking. Mm-hmm. And are you seeing that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the majority of the people we treat. Um, it's alcohol, is it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and sort of middle-class, middle-of-the-road, regular folk. Um, it's it's because um, well I'm not, there, there are lots of reasons why but you know lots of people will go through life having their bottle of wine with dinner coming home or having a few beers and it's just not a problem it doesn't affect them in any way and, and we're certainly not anti-alcohol um, most people do it without a problem you know I need to say that I don't want to make it sound as though everybody's suddenly got a problem but there are those, you know it's also about can I stop if I have to? Can I? Do I know when I've had enough? And and again, if we look at our close network of family and friends, most people do, but some people can't. And it's not because you know they're bad or they or they lack control. It's it's because it's you know the addictive nature is just in certain people, and and those people are the ones that need help. Paul Spangia in the studio, 0345 30 30 961 for any questions for him. We've got a question from Gareth, who's in Southampton, about um, nicotine, about cigarettes. I'll ask that question to Paul in just a moment. BBC Radio Solent, Steelers wheels stuck in the middle with you. Paul Spangia from the Providence Project in Bournemouth in the studio talking about... Uh, Addiction, dealing with it, rehab, or just uh, just everything, really. And your questions to Paul on 0345 30 30 961. Don't worry, if you if you call that number, you don't go straight on air or anything like that, and you can change your name, that's fine with me. The text message number is 8133. Start your text with the word Solent. There's a question from Gareth, who's in Southampton. Uh, he's talking about what he says, and he's used the term an addiction to cigarettes. Uh, he says, how can I stop this? I find myself waking up in the middle of the night and just needing to have a cigarette. I mean, that's nicotine addiction. Yep. Uh, nicotine is one of the two or three most addictive substances we know of. Uh, what, what are they, by the way? Just Well, well, I mean, there, there are arguments on that, but what we do know is any, any drug that is inhaled gives an immediate uh, hit. You know, that's why you see a smoker as they, as they breathe in, that sort of uh, effect. Um... Nicotine is highly addictive, um, but there are some really great um, programs available through the NHS now. You know, the, the NHS have really stepped up their game on smoking over the last 10 years with the stop smoking clinics, there's certain medications, there's certain courses and groups. Because with any addiction, what Graham's describing is the physical addiction, which uh, actually only takes three to four days before all physical, you know, whatever a smoker tells you. The reality is after three days, there is no physical addiction. Three days without a cigarette, any cravings that somebody gets... It's mental. It's psychological. Psychological yeah. cravings. Yeah, absolutely. So what Graham's experienced is physical craving, and they can be quite difficult. And, and, and the great thing about any kind of support group and what works, one of the reasons rehab can work, is just having people in the same situation as you, you can ring up. You know, when, when you want to do something that you know is not good for you, if you're trying to deal with it in isolation, it's always harder um so so sort of getting support for the nhs is something that i could highly recommend for i mean do you get any nicotine addiction no, with we, you? we don't treat um nicotine addiction as such if people are with us in treatment and they want to stop then we'll provide them with support but i wouldn't take somebody into rehab um solely for a nicotine addiction what, simply because it's not dare i say it's not serious no um, no not that it's not serious it's just um you know, because as well as the, the, the alcohol or drug addiction, we're also looking at some of the behavioural issues related. Um, nicotine addiction is obviously incredibly dangerous for, for health reasons. But it maybe doesn't have the same impact on relationships, on psychological well-being, on, you know, as alcohol or gambling mm. or other process addiction. So that that's one of the reasons. And also... Because it's not a no-smoking environment, it would be like taking somebody in for rehab for alcohol when other people are allowed to drink. It's a little bit difficult coming to rehab. Oh, you mean that the actual tr- centre isn't no-smoking? Yeah, yeah I mean, obviously yeah. inside is because every yeah. building is nowadays. But what I mean is because a proportion of our residents 
do smoke, to take somebody who's trying to stop and he's surrounded by people that are smoking is not the exactly the best environment. No, possibly not. Possibly not. We've not spoken that much about gambling. Mm. Um, and I know that you've got a real issue with what you call the fixed odds yes. machines. And we, you and I have spoken before about how they are... I mean, they're called the crack cocaine mm. of gambling. Mm. And for anyone who doesn't know, what, do you, what are they? Are they like the fruit machine type things? Yeah, although well, they're slightly different to the sort of fruit machines of years gone by. Um, they are sort of digital in their appearance as opposed to the sort of the classic three reels. And the sums involved are just vast. Um, you, know, and, you know, and when you win, it doesn't sort of chuck out a load of coins. It gives you a receipt, which you then cash in. Um which very often they don't even have enough to pay you out and then you have to wait for the money. And But that's a whole another issue. So the, the stakes are very high. They're highly addictive. Um, this keeps going through Parliament. This keeps being challenged by various MPs. Um, nothing's really happened yet. I mean, they're limited to, I believe it's four of these machines per, per bookmakers. Um, but, you know, the, the online the growth of online gambling, you've only got to see the profits sort of posted by the huge uh, websites. You know, the football season starting tomorrow and all you'll see is advert after advert after advert. Um, probably how we used to see it with smoking uh, uh, 30 years ago. You know, the, 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 you know the, the snooker was always sponsored by a tobacco company. Yeah. The, the, the cricket was always sponsored by a tobacco company. And, it's, and they're no longer allowed, as far as I understand. But... But there hasn't been much in the way of legislating sort of the same with gambling. Um, and, and it's just, it's so destructive. And, uh, you know, we, we see the damage on families, how it, how it just is ripping families apart. And, and there's not much help out there, really. Um, and it's a very difficult addiction to overcome. Because, again, denial and dishonesty is such a part of the person with the problem you know, the main symptom is they believe they haven't got a problem. Mm. Um, and all they need is to back a winner tomorrow and everything will be okay. So uh, we are seeing a growth in, in people presenting for, for for gambling. So if you're seeing a growth in that, are there any... Uh, do these things go in fashions? I hate to use that word, but... Yeah, you know. I mean, d different different... Over the years, different drugs have been more popular... Uh, different drinks, the, the way in which people drink. Um, I mean, if you were to look, again, obviously keeping stuff confidential, but if you were to look at who you had in the centre at mm -hmm. the moment, or have done over the last six months or mm -hmm. so, um, what what do you see? Um, a lot of it can come down to sort of um, social factors. I mean, depending on where people come from and their social groupings, you can often predict what... Uh, problem they may have like how do you mean so you know we spoke about the glass of wine mm -hmm. the sort of working middle classes uh, going to work picking the children up from school having a friend round, opening a bottle of wine pro you know problem developing into sort of you know two bottles of wine hiding the wine etc um so, you know i'm not allowed I, I don't really know what i'm allowed to say but in terms of drugs but 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 co cocaine is you know, worryingly acceptable in certain middle class situations. Um, you know, lots of the people we treat say that, you know, the people I socialise with, the places I drink, it's actually quite normal in certain um, social groupings. So things are becoming in some areas more acceptable and then it's people like you who sort of have to put people back together. Yeah, and, you know, you know there are some people that do it without causing too much harm. You know... In, you know, again, we talk about norms. You know, young people and cannabis. You know, and, and the cannabis is incredibly strong and incredibly dangerous, and and it's very common for groups of fourteen, fifteen, sixteen year olds to start um, trying cannabis. You know, and and some won't develop problems, but some do. Um, and so again, that's the sort of drug use you would expect to see in, in a younger group. OK, um, question from Michael, who's at pains to say it's not his real name, his 13-year-old son. He thinks he's smoking cannabis. He says he can smell it mm -hmm. on him. What does he do? 
what's your, he basically says can can you give can you give me some advice on whether I should tackle this when I should tackle it or whether I should try and ask his friends first I think it's it absolutely it's important to to bring it in the open um I would never advise any family to sort of ignore the problem or potential problem and it is you know I don't want to underestimate anybody to underestimate how dangerous you know, there's a sort of a, an underlying belief amongst certain areas of society that cannabis is oh, maybe a bit softer. And particularly when we're talking about young people, it's not. We, we, we know there's rafts of research now to demonstrate the damage on the brain. Um, I would have an honest and open conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it is also very affordable now to buy drug testing kits. Um where do you get them from? Online? Yeah, there, there are a variety of companies that sell them online. I think drug test kits are less than five pounds. They're near enough 100% accurate. Uh, cannabis does stay in the system a long time. Um, uh, so so it, it, it's important to find out the truth because it's, it's it, the only way any progress can be made is to, to at least find out what's happening. So almost what you're suggesting is right at the very beginning, sort of keep it in the family in as much as it's sort of like so that the family has it as an open discussion get drug testing kits and what say I'm going to test you every week or something or I mean every family will decide what's right for them we don't sort of offer a, a, a real prescriptive guideline on it um, but I would recommend period that you know young people should not be smoking cannabis full stop um, no exceptions and it's important to find out the truth um, so that if help is required, you can get the, the right help. So I would try and have an honest and open conversation. But if, if that wasn't enough to satisfy a parent, then there's no there's no problem with, with doing a drug test. Uh, the final one, um, I'm not going to mention this person's name. They've asked me to keep them anonymous. Uh, they say, please, can you tell me, what are the options for people who can't afford to pay for their treatment because people pay to come yeah, and stay yeah, with sure. you uh, and and pay a lot of money mm-hmm. um, if if they're there for any amount of time. So if you can't afford to pay. Mm-hmm. Private treatment, you know, starts at around £700 a week. So it's, as you say, it's not cheap and it's out of the reach of, of many families. The reason we've seen the growth in private treatment is that, is that much of the help or treatment available has been cut over the last 10 years. Um, and and it's, it's quite difficult to answer without knowing the person's exact story because depending on where they are and depending on what the problem is will depend on what help may be available. Well, I tell you what, they, they've not told me at all. It literally says, what are the options for people who cannot afford to pay for their treatment? Don't mention my name. They've not told me what the what their issue yeah. is or where they are. Can we just assume that they're local? OK. Um, there will be a both an alcohol and a drug team um, in, within any local council who will certainly assess any uh, body who's looking for help. The, the, once they've been assessed, they will look for the most appropriate course of help, which sometimes isn't fast in coming. Sometimes is again, it depends on on the team you're with. But there might be an option of some sort of outpatient services. There might be the option of some counselling. There might be the option of some prescribing, depending on what the addiction is. Um, and that's the route to go down. You know, you can sort of look up your local alcohol or drug misuse team, and and give them a call. And it's a if you're looking online, it's a dot gov dot yes. what you just so go. It's the council website. Yes. And then and then start there. Not go to your GP first. Um, some people, you know, GPs can also refer refer on to um, substance misuse teams or alcohol misuse teams. But generally, you you can refer yourself straight into what we call a tier two, which is a local drug and alcohol team without a GP referral. Generally, so it might be quicker. Possibly. Yeah. Very, very best of luck to them, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you coming in. Um, I'm sure I'm sure we'll speak again. Yeah, sure. Uh, probably, uh, I don't know, next next few months or so, get you back and answer a few more questions. Paul Spanjar from the Providence Project in Bournemouth. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.